Vegas, and like I said, you've been introduced, and that is my wife. Um, this is what we're gonna, I'm gonna run you through here is an outline of my story, Falling Sky, and um, uh, my, my story actually begins when you see this class, so you can see what I'm doing here. My story actually begins, I was four and a half years old, 1965. I lived in uh, Lucas Alley in a hyper home, um, and I was literally, <laughs> 7.6 miles before I crow flight from the Skywalker Ranch. I was at 21 oh. I remained there, and that's what Skywalker Ranch is. Okay, just some fun facts. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, Eichler Homes, but they were built with a glass back, and they had an inner atrium. When you all walked in your front door, you were in the inner atrium. My, bro my brothers and I and my sisters used to uh, sleep out in the atrium in the summertime, okay, and the stars. I was just a little tight, and they talked about um, the different constellations, what they, what they uh, thought they were, and they told me to shut up, I didn't know anything. And then they also talked about the um, crickets, and they, they discussed how crickets were a warning device for soldiers, that when they're uh, noisy, you knew everything was safe, but when they're quiet, something was coming up on you, okay? So I, I, I paid attention to that. So when I go to sleep at night, I hear crickets, and when I didn't hear them, I'd open my eyes, I'd look up along the, the uh, rooftop there where the um, atrium was, and I'd see a cat or something coming in. So one night, uh, my brothers and sisters drift off, and I'm asleep, and the crickets are going, and all of a sudden, the crickets stop. So I, I, I wake up, I sit up, and I look up on the, the top of the atrium, and there's nothing there. I say, well, whatever. So I go to lay down, and as I turn my eyes, I see these three foot of beans by my, by my uh, sleeping bag. And I was so scared, I, I wet my pajamas, I wet the sleeping bag, I was terrified. And I go, who are you? What do you want? They said, we're your parents. I said, you're not my parents. I said, my parents are sleeping in the bed. I said, who are you? And they said, we're your parents. Those are your guardians. They're going to watch you while you're growing up. I said, we're going to take you with us for now. We'll bring you back. And I said, all I remember is blacking out at that moment. Okay, next thing I remember is waking up my sleeping bag in the morning. Completely wet. Let's go in the house. My dad makes a big issue about me being wet, okay? My dad was a very um, aggressive man and wasn't very nice about a lot of things, uh, but he was more interested in the sleeping bag. When I told him, who, asked him who were the little hooded beings or men, I said, that I called the men at the time that came to the atrium, and he goes, what men came to the atrium? I said, some men with the hoods were in there, and they took me away. He says, you're not sleeping out there again. Um, <laughs> so he, and he, actually, oddly enough, his face looked like he knew what I was talking about. And he was, my dad was, was ex-Air Force, okay? Okay, so he, he knew what I was talking about. And um, I, knew, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but obviously he knew what I was talking about. And he had had experiences himself, and he was just, he didn't want to acknowledge us. So my mom woke up, she worked cocktails at night time, and they, he was fighting with me, and he got in a fight. I went out to my backyard where my, where my tree fort is. That is the um, next, uh, this is me, this is my tree fort. Back here, this was the fence, and over here I overlooked the Lucas Valley Elementary School, okay? And um, I had a little hoist here, I hoist my little cockapoo up there. It's 1965, 19, uh, I was in kindergarten, and I went a half a day. And I used to, the kids used to play in the field there, at the school they played, the football games, whatever games they played. I'd sit there and it was like a stadium seat, I'd watch them. And um, one day I get done, and I come down there, I hoist my dog down, I go in the house, my mom says to me, she says, where were you? I said, my tree board. And like I said, I had the glass window at the back so she could see my tree board. And um, she says, you weren't your tree board. I said, I was in my tree board. She says, you weren't your tree board. She says, Michael Davis, you jumped that fence, you went over to the school. I said, no, I didn't. I was in my tree board the whole time. She says, no, you weren't. I went in the yard trying to get the dog out of the tree. I couldn't. She says, you go to your room. She didn't believe me, okay? And that just really bothered me that my mom didn't believe me. I was up there the whole time, okay? And I didn't know what was going on. All right. Now, chapter three, I know this is King's Ascent, Descent. If you read the book, it gets a little more detailed about what's going on here. But um, 1973, I'm like 12 years old, the spring. Um, we moved, my parents bought a place out on the roller road and moved back and forth. Went from Lucas, from Lucas Valley to Petaluma East Side. Then they went back down to Santa Benicia and back to Petaluma. Wound up on a roller road, okay? Um, my grandma lived in Washington, that's why they bought the farm place out there. And my mom wanted to be with my with my with her mom. So um, she um as her move in with us, and I got very close with my grandma. And she didn't like the way my dad was beating the boys, and she said she just she my, was me it was me, my dad, my brother Rich, my mom, and my grandmother, and my two aunts in this farmhouse. And she says, he's very abusive, and I'd like you guys to move out with me and leave him. 
my mom said, no, no, he said, Johannes Downey kill us. That's the way he the way he was, Johannes Downey kill us. Yeah. So she said, well, I'm not staying here. She said, I can't live here. She said, what I want you to do, she tells me, she says, in that barn there, the place I lived at was an old stage stop, okay? It's out on Robo Road, and it was, they used to stop at the washing house, and they'd go down, and it was the livery stop, okay? They'd change horses, the back of the stalls were where the horses would go, and there was a uh, tack room in the uh, middle of the, uh, the one barn. And that's, my grandmother said, turn that into a dark room. She said, you're into photography, she's you're very good at it. She says, I'll pay for the equipment. I said, I don't know if Dad will do that. She says, talk to your mom. She says, turn it into a, turn it into a dark room. So you can put a lock in the door and stay away from it. I can't here because your mom's working nights and um, so I did that. Uh, I made a dark room in that barn. I uh, used black plastic to cover the inside of it to block all the light out. Grandma bought all the largers and everything. I spent my time in this dark room at night time. Um, on the back wall I had an old, I ran out of black plastic so um, I looked I looked around the house for uh, something to block the light leaks in the back wall so I found my sixth grade science project and it was tag board I put on the back wall. That's significant in a little bit. Um, so, and that's why I spent my time was in that dark room. I'm out there, it's 1973 now, late summer, and um, Grandma says to me, she's in the back, black race, all right, she said, I'm going to go pick some of some jams, and she didn't leave yet, she hasn't moved yet. She says, I'll, I'll make some pies. She says, um, so, jam. So we went out there and we're picking blackberries. My mom, my brother Rich and I, and uh, we were right next to the newer barn. And I found a little nook in the berry bushes like that. And I'm out there with my buckets picking the berries. And I look off from my peripheral vision up to the right and I see in the barn window, I see an orange orb. And it's about the size, probably double the size of a tennis ball mm -hmm. floating out the window. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. I was just a kid. It came floating up and I just floated right next to it. I'm still picking these berries. This thing's floating next to me. What is this? And all of a sudden I look and it's got this face in it. I didn't know at the time. But I, it was an alien face inside of this orb. And it's sitting there, and it's like it's like turning its face, staring at me, checking me out, and I'm checking it out. And I go, Mom, come here, there's something here. And she goes, Why? Go, come here, there's something here. And she goes over there. And right as she reaches the nook, this thing shrinks down to the size of a, about a double, about double uh, uh, silver dollar, about like that. And it shoots inside of the hole in the bush. Inside of the bush. And she goes, What? I said, she goes, What? I said, There's a little ball here with a face in it. She goes, Where? I said, it just went inside the bush. <laughs> and she's gone, there's nothing there. And I said, it was just here. Here we are again. Okay, this is the second time. She's not believing me, okay? And she's just picked the berries. We're never going to have to have pie and jam. So anyway, um, I, I finished, we finished picking the berries, but the whole time I was looking for this darn little orb, and I couldn't find it again. So, um, here we are about a month later, September. Um, my dad's watching a game. My mom's at work, and he says to me, uh, it's a weekend, he says, go out there, and um, he says, the loom saws on the porch, he says, get the ladder from the barn, I want you to trim the lower branches of the pear tree behind the house. So I go off behind the house, grab the loom saw, I start cutting the first branch on this pear tree, and all of a sudden, I hear a sound like a hype, I don't know if you're familiar with the t sound of picture tubes, uh, of TV tubes when they first go up, a very high pitched sound, like, okay, and I look up at the top or upper branches, and this is up there, just like that. It's just like a bright orange orb, probably about that big, okay, and there's a face in it again. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, I didn't realize it at the time when I was a kid, but there was a significance. First I'm seeing it at the blackberry bushes, now I'm seeing it at the pear tree, okay? It's like they're protecting this fruit of some sort. And I was there running with a limb saw, and as I get a couple swipes there, all of a sudden it appears. So I run in the house, told my dad, there's something here, I go again, the cat's in the tree, you know? But he, I go, there's something in this tree, Dad. He says, oh, come on, let's see, what are you talking about now? So he goes out in the yard, and I said, it, it was not there. He goes, it's not there now. I said, here, I'll cut the branches. You can haul it up. You haul, you haul the branches out to the dump trailer. So he gets on the ladder, and he starts with the top branches, and he starts cutting the branches that he wanted off of there. And as soon as he makes his first wipe in the branch, the, his whole ladder just starts going, shh, 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 shaking violently. He goes, hey, 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 grab the ladder. What's wrong? He's going to fall off this thing. Something was shaking his ladder, okay? Um, I didn't know what it was at the time, but something was definitely shaking his head. My brother and I went to Rancho Cotahuke High School when we lived out there. And um, this is spring of 74. We used to take the bus from, uh, from Robo Road up to, uh, to high school. And we had to be there 10 minutes early for the bus or my dad would have a cow. Okay? He would freak out if we missed the bus. And so we were always there early. We didn't want to miss that bus. The bus would come down the hill this way, go down to a property down there, turn around and head back this way. 
morning. The bus stop is right here where that mailbox is. This is an actual photo of where it is. The bus stop is right there at that mailbox, and this is a driveway over here. As we're running up to the bus stop, my brother's ahead of me, I'm behind him. Um, all of a sudden, I hear that sound TV dudes, okay? That's, it's that same sound. It's coming from the driveway. I get about, I, all of a sudden, I see these two little orbs floating out of the driveway, okay? And as I'm running up there, I stop right over where my brother is. These things come up in, my, in front of my face. They flip up and go, like they're scanning me. And then they just go, up to my brother. He's at the bus stop. They do the same thing to him. And he goes like this. He shoes him away. But that, the things take off. They all, they just as they get to the crest, they all just go straight up to the sky. I go, what was that, Rich? And I don't know. And as right as they go up the hill, up in the sky, the bus comes over the hill. Okay, we should be 10 minutes early for the bus. And the bus is pulling up to the stop. And I'm like, wait, how can I be late? And you left there. I'm thinking, as a kid, I was confused. That's why I was just talking about being confused. There's confusion with this because, like, what's going on here? How can it be right here on time with the bus? Anyway, I get on. I start telling friends of the bus what I saw. They're all calling crazy or whatever. Okay, and I just dropped it. My brother didn't want to talk about it, and so uh, I let it go. Um, so, about two weeks later, my mom's working nice. My brother Rich is out with friends. She didn't stick around much more because he didn't want to be around dad much. Um, I, I had no choice. I was on that property alone at night time. At, uh, 13 years old, excuse me, 74 is 13. And uh, my mom would leave for work right as I was getting off school. And uh, my dad's coming home. And the, okay, as he comes out, and he comes in the front door, he says to me, he says, a strange thing happened to me. I go, what? And he goes, well, I was coming down the hill, and right as I reached our property, he said, I look to the right in our field there, he says, I see two taillights of a car. Mm -hmm. And I go, taillights of a car? Now I knew, I said, what do you mean? He says, just red taillights. He says, what type of car were they on? He says, what's weird? He says, there was no car. He says, they're just sitting in the field. And I, and I go, <laughs> you know, right there. All right, and this is what I've been seeing, okay? So I, I, I'm think, I'm a kid, and I'm thinking, oh, this is my turn, okay? <laughs> this is my turn. I said, oh, come on, Dad. You know cars. So you have to have a car with taillights. I said, and besides, you have chains and every one of your gates. Nobody can even get into the field. I said, you're crazy. I said, you're, you're seeing things. He says, I know it's just strange. I don't know what to think it. I said, maybe you need glasses. Your vision's going or something like that. Old. And, and he goes, that's probably it. He goes, what's for dinner? Like that. He, he just he swallowed the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. I knew what he was seeing because I had seen him, but he wasn't very nice to me about things that I had seen. He, all he did was give me a cup of um, So this is my dark room. This is actually the shot of it. This is what I converted in the barn. This is where I spent. This is the old stagecoach barn. Back there where the stables were, this was an old tack room, okay? Um, like I said, I put the black plastic all over the place. And um, my brother Rich had gotten his driver's license and he was gone all the time. He was never there. He stayed away during his always spending nights at friends' houses, leaving me there alone with that. Um, let's see. Uh, Dad, what would happen is mom wound up leaving Dad at some point there, right, right at that point. She, she didn't get fed up and she left me there with him. So I, I'm stuck out there. It's like, like a horror movie being with this man out there alone. Okay, I'm just being honest with all this other stuff going on too. Anyway, I spent a lot of time in that dark room like my grandmother planned. And um, I had to be in by midnight. He said, you have to be in the house by midnight, which was late. But um, one night, I'm out in the dark room and I had a little fluorescent clock out there that I kept covered with a towel because I didn't want it exposing uh, the, the, the prints or the film. So I, I knew it was getting late, so I look at it, and it's 11.55, so I wrap up everything. I put all of my stuff in my hand, and I'm leaving this dark room right here. I put the hasp on the door, and as I walk out of the barn, I, pull, I go to pull the chain switch right, right where the exit where the exit of the barn. That's burned out, the lights, the lights are great. So I go to the end, end of the barn, open the door, as I open the door, and I look back to, to, the, back, to the back of the barn. I hear, I hear, first of all, what caused me to look back there is I hear what sounds to me like kids running back there. And I turn, I see this face peeking around the back side of the barn, okay? And all I, I thought, first thought it was a cat, because we had cats out there, and, I, and I'm going, I look, it's not a cat, it's got big black eyes, it's got like a, a grayish, whitish pallor to it. And I'm, that's, that's not a cat, what, cat, what the hell is it? I go, hey, who, what are you? And I keep hearing this, this shuffling back there. And, and with that, I just freaked. I just started running to the house. Um, and as I'm running to the house, I hear something chasing me, and I hear that sound, the TV tubes, and also like a clicking, like a, like almost like, a, the, thing, the best way to describe it 
is like uh, an echolocation that dolphins put out. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Like they're tracking you, and it's like as that's going on. And I was chasing you all the way back to the house. I go sailing inside the house. I open the front door, slam the door behind me, hit the big floodlight out there. And as I'm looking out the window, that's what's out there. Two orbs out there. I tell my dad, and my dad turned around, my dad standing at the door, his arms folded, where were you? I go, Dad, if something's chasing me out there, he says, there's nothing chasing you out there. He says, where the hell were you? Okay, I go, I said, something's chasing me out there. He says, no. He says, I want to know where you were. He says, you're going to tell me right now. I said, I was in the dark room. He says, you weren't in the dark room. I said, I was in that dark room. He goes, you weren't in there. He says, hey, look at the time. He goes, it's 1.30. He said, I went out to that dark room. He said, I pounded that door. He said, you wouldn't open it. How you locked it on the inside and got out of that dark room, I don't know, but I want to know how you did it, and I want to know where you were. I said, I was inside that dark room. He said, you weren't there. He said, you were supposed to be in this house. He said, at, at, at midnight. He says, 1.30. He says, you're an hour, hour and a half late, okay? An hour and 35 minutes late. He says, I want to know where you were. I, he just would not believe me. He says, he was ready to beat me right there, and that's what he did. He beat, he beat me to a pole. He put, uh, one point, the, the school principal got involved, and was going to have me taken away. And I said it wasn't him because I, I, he was a foster kid himself, and I knew what he went through as a foster child, and I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go through that. So I, I, I stood up for him, um, but he, he wanted to beat me just to go to bed. Something stopped him at that moment, and uh, possibly those I don't know, possibly those who would stop. Him. I'm laying on my bed. This is uh, shortly after this. I'm laying on my bed, and uh, he's. Once again, watching a game and his team is losing. And when his team lose, loses, he would always bet on the underdogs and he'd get killed, okay? Mm -hmm. And he comes in my room, he sees me with headphones on, and listening like the Doobie Brothers or something. He says, Come here, follow me. I go, Where are we going? He says, Just follow me and shut your mouth. So I go following him, and he goes out to the barn, and I go, Oh, he's gonna get to get here. So he goes back to the stables, back to the stalls there, and he's pointing to the corner. He goes, See that shovel hole and rake over there? He says, you know what you're supposed to do with that? I said, yeah, I did shovel home and rake with it. And he goes, no, what were you supposed to do with this? I said, I don't, I don't know. What was I supposed to do with this? And he goes, shovel the horse crap out of the barn. Your horse is here. He says, you, what are you going to do? Leave it sit here. I said, I'm sorry, I forgot I'll do it right now. He says, no, I said, let me remind you what's going to happen next time you forget. So he picks me up by my hair, he groups that hair out of my head, throws me, kicks me across the barn, and to this stall didn't feed me in here. This the actual stall this happens in, just so you know, that mark is still there where his wheelbarrow was, up in that corner. And his picture was taken back in uh, August, last August, just so you know. And these orbs are in this picture too, that's kind of odd. But uh, he throws me, he throws me over over this stall here, and then he comes back and he grabs me by the throat and lifts me off the ground, he's strangling me, okay? And I, he, did, he did this, I don't know how many times he did this to me, and to the point I'm on the ground, I start blacking out, and I think I'm dying. I figure this is it, it's over. And all of a sudden, all of the cracks in the barn grew really bright white with white light, okay? And as, as it grew bright with the white light, millions, I can't even, I can't, this is nothing, just millions of white orbs start falling down with little particles falling down to the ceiling. And as I watch him, my, my mind, my horse is in this stall over here, and he's freaking out because he loved me, okay? I watch as I'm laying on the ground, my dad gets shoved, as he comes after me again, he gets shoved back by, I don't know what it was, against this wall here, and as, he's, as I'm laying on the ground, I see his feet go off the ground about six inches or so. He's lifted with all these orbs, and he gets literally thrown clear across this 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 this, this stall here, into the same feet that I was. Yeah. This happens two times. The third time he's lifted, he says, run, Mike, just run, get out of here, run. So I did, I ran into the house. I, I went inside, I locked the, the doors, uh, the, 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 the front door, and um, I went back in the hidden closet, waited for about 20 minutes or so. Um, then all of a sudden, I hear the front door open with the key, and he comes walking in. He goes, Mike, Mike, come here, come here, come here. I thought, oh, he's going to kill me. He says, no, no, come here, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I should never have touched you. I should never have touched you. Now, something that I didn't know, but, I, but my grandmother told me when she was living there, she says, your father shouldn't lay a hand on you. She says, because you come from royalty. I said, what royalty? She says, you come, she says, I don't know, some king in Austria. She says, I don't know exactly who it is, but my sister Cirilla knows who it is. Maybe talk to her, she can tell you all about it. She says, where, where you come from, he be beheaded. Anyway, my dad says, I'm sorry, I should never lay a hand on you. I should never ever touch you. And he says, I'm sorry, I won't ever do it. I promise I'll give my word, I'll never touch you again. Like that, he didn't. From that day on, he never laid another hand on me. He had even, his mama, my mom actually 
came back to him afterwards, after this happened. Um, he wanted to go into church. He insisted that we go to the Christian Life Center, every, every, all the way up to where uh, the Burbank Center is up there in Santa Rosa, all the way from Robel Road, Robel Road every weekend, and insisted on it. Um, then they had another kid, and he never laid a hand on that child either. So he kept his word after that. After all those years, he kept his word. He never touched me again or, or any one of us. So something very startling happened to him in there. There was 20 minutes that he was in there that I don't know about. And I asked him what it was. He says, I don't know. He says, well, I, I can't explain it. I said, what was all the white light? What were all those things? Like? He said, I don't know. Even on his deathbed, when he was dying from cancer, I asked him, what do you think that was, Dad? He says, I don't know if I, I can't explain it. So we got along later in life. Anyway, we go on further. Some time has passed. January 1977. Let me get a drink of water. Let come out. 1977, uh, around 9.30 p.m., my friend Spike and I are up on Manor Lane. I don't know if any of you know where Manor Lane is, up where there. next to the old adobe there is, out uh, Old Adobe Road there in Petaluma, up in the mountains. It goes two directions, straight up, or you can go left, okay? This time, we're straight up. And uh, we're about 939, and Spike and I are just talking, this is the radio, and um, we're talking, I wonder about this, I wonder about that, and Spike says, what I wonder is what's that? And he's pointing at the moon across the way. <laughs> I said, it's the moon, you moron. And he goes, no, oh, okay. He says, all right. And he goes, what does that mean? Well, there's another moon up there. I said, I don't know, that's peculiar. And then back, he says, look back. He says, look again. There were three moons across the, the horizon, plus another moon up yeah. next there. I said, it's four moons. He says, where is that? I go, I don't know. It looks like it's out by Tomal. It says it up at a two rock coast guard base or something like that. He says, let's go. So he, he was, we split the mountains. We, fly, we go all the way down to um, down up to two bar, two bar Coast Guard base. We pull up to the driveway, and he starts asking the, the guard, the gate, the gate guard. He says, he says, did you guys see the four moons in the sky? And he goes, four moons in the sky, huh? Like that. And it just starts right there. Okay? It starts right there. And I go, Spike, leave. Just leave. I said, this guy, don't, don't, don't deal with these people. He says, no. He says, this guy's an idiot. He's making fun of me. And I said, dude, don't. Let's leave. And he starts getting into an argument with this, guy, this gate guard. I said, split now. So he does. We leave. That is the last time I, I, I literally talked this way. Last, the next thing, you know, he's hanging out with my brother. And he just, I had not seen him again after this incident. And he, he was hanging out with my brother. And it's like, it's like, it's just weird at that, at that incident. And that wasn't the only time I've seen this. My brother and I, 1977, later, later on that same year in the summer, we go up the manor lane again. And this time we're with two girls in the car, and it wasn't my wife. It was before I met her, okay? She knows about this. <laughs> but, I, I've heard about it. <laughs> she's heard about it. Well, I, I have to. I mean, but anyway, we're, we're, <laughs> we're, we're up in the mountains. It's about 11.35 at night, and I know this because I had a wristwatch in my arm. I wore a wristwatch at the time. And um, I, I was, I, and we get out of the back of the car, my brother says he puts his Thin Lizzy Live and Dangerous tape in his auto reverse deck with his, with the car. And the girls in the back seat of the car, and um, he says, come on, I want to talk to you, brother. So we go to the back of the trunk. This is actually a picture of me, and that's actually my brother, and that's actually his car, believe it or not, up there. And there's a little spot in this, uh, right before, where it goes left up the manor lane, there was a little spot right before the farmhouse where you pull out there, and there's the creek there and everything else. He says, I want to talk to you. I he says, he says, gets to the trunk of the car, but this is the first song. He says, what do you think of these girls? And I said, I don't know. I said, I'm really tired. I want to go home. I'm, I'm beat. And he goes, oh, come on. It's early. And with that, he goes, what is that? I can turn around and what? He goes, look behind you. And there's behind and the tree there, I see an orange dome. It's like a bright orange, I can't even say it's just an orange glistening dome above the tree. And I turn around and I said, I don't know. What do you think it is? He goes, I don't know. He says, he says, look at it again. He says, it's getting bigger. It's double the size. Okay. I says, he says, I said, let's go check it out. He goes, no, get in the car. He says, get in the car. And I said, let's go check it out. He said, come on, dude, let's check it out. And he goes, no, get in the car. He says, I'll leave you here. So He's flying to the car, start getting ready to start this thing. I said, dude, come on. He says, get her, I'm leaving you here. So I fly and get in the passenger seat, and we split out of the mountains. There's an eerie stillness, silent in the car, okay? It's just dead silent, okay? And this this is what's weird. As we're going down the, down the hill, the girl goes, what's wrong with you guys? What's going on? And my brother said, did you see that out there? No, we didn't see anything. You guys have been gone for 45 minutes. And, and, and he goes, what's, what are you talking about, you stupid? And he goes, what are you talking about? She, he said, we're right at the trunk for five minutes. He says, by the way, who touched my tape deck? Who, who turned off my tape? She says, nobody touched it. The plate all the way through. It was switched to the other side. It didn't end it. And he's going, so this, all of a sudden, it just got really silent. They're like, how could this be? And we couldn't figure out the confusion. There's that confusion again, OK? It's like, how could this be happening? It's not possible. Not much more said. We dropped off the girls. We went home. 
they literally went to bed. Uh, and, and we didn't discuss it for about three days. Finally, my brother said, he says, brother, you know what that was we saw in the mountains? And I go, no, it was. I said, you want to believe it? He said, that was God. Mm -hmm. I said, that wasn't God. I said, that was not God. He goes, that was God. I said, that was not God. That's not what God looks like. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, he says, have you ever seen God? I go, I don't think so. I said, why have you? And he says, yes. I said, when? He said, when my daughter was born. And when she was born, his daughter was born with all of her intestines, liver, spleen, gallbladder, and outside of her. Okay? She was at Children's Hospital for, for, for three months while he slowly put her back in. He said, I was working at the docks in Richmond. He says, I was coming across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. He says, coming into San Rafael so I can go up to San Francisco to see my kid in the hospital. He says, and as I'm crossing that bridge, he says, the sun's out, he said, look in the sky. He said, I saw that orb, that bright glowing orange ball in the sky. He said, I knew that moment that everything was going to be all right. And his daughter was. She survived and she's all right. I said, then why didn't you want to go see him? If you thought that was God, why didn't we go see him? He said, brother, I'm divorced. I'm up here with two girls. I'm not doing things I'm, I should be doing, and I don't want to meet God yet. <laughs> and I actually understood what he's saying, and I said, Dude, he should have still gone and checked out. I said, look, I'm not ready to meet God, and neither are you. And that's where that, that's where that stood. <laughs> um, so, here we are, five years later, 1982. This is Eucalyptus Avenue, here in Petaluma. This is actually an image from Google Earth that I painted up, okay? Um, this is my house here. That's my brother's house there. This is a shed here. And my parents' house is there. This is my parents' property. This is the parking lot. It's a seven-acre parcel, okay? This is 120 mile rate pine seedlings that grew in the big trees that we planted around our houses, okay? And, um, well, we heated this, this place with, a, with an airtight stove and kerosene heater, okay? And we kept the kerosene stored in this shed right there. Um, one night, about 9 o'clock, Susie says, you want to start a fire? I don't know. So just to get some kerosene for the heater. She says, just relax, I'll go do it. So she goes walking down this cobblestone at the state down there. The, there. And she comes racing back up there. And I'm not here. Susie, come here. Come up here, please. Um, because this is you. I, I'm not going to speak for you. Okay. When, when you, when you, okay, you can, you can, you, come over here. Come over here. Come over here. Come over here. All right. This, this is you, okay. When, when you came back up, you said, you said to me, there's something in the barn. And I said, what, what's yeah. in the barn? Yeah, I go down to get the kerosene one night and I heard voices. And, now, where the cottage was at the time, you know, where it is, it's pretty remote out there. There's not, you know, you wouldn't expect people walking through the field at nighttime. So I come back up and I tell them, I said, there's voices down here. I said, what are the voices saying? And they, they just sounded like, shh, 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 you know, it wasn't really anything audible. I dismissed it. I dismissed it myself. Yeah, exactly. You did dismiss it. I did. So you go down to get you know, the kerosene. Right now, let me tell my what happened with me. Yes. Then, okay. Then I said, I'm going to get the kerosene. We're cold. I'm, we're going to get heat tonight. I'm not starting a fire. It's getting late. So I go. I said, I'm going. She says, Don't go down there now. Don't go down. I said, I'm going down there. And so I go down to the barn, walk down there, go to the shed. There's no light there. We used to flash light to pump the kerosene. Okay. Um, so we go to the. I go to the back of. I go to the back of the shed there, and it's windy that night. I pick. I get the wind. Okay. Old bar buildings rocking, right? Um, it used to get really windy out there, and I start pumping the kerosene in. As I start pumping, I hear, Who's there? I stop, I stop pumping. Who's there? Also, I hear the wind. Like that. And I go, Okay, I start pumping again. I hear, Hey! Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm screwing her on as I'm running up the hill. I get in there, I lock the door in the house. I don't know why you did that. Ridiculous. Lock the door. I told her, I said, there is something down there. And she goes, see, I told you. I said, you know what's really weird? I said, I said, called me by name. Yeah. And she goes, I called you. I said, it called my name twice. She goes, what was it? I said, I don't know. I didn't say anything. And I didn't realize until later on what somebody told me. It's called the calling. Okay? This is called the calling. All right? The calling? The calling. C-A-L-L-I-N-G. The calling. The calling, okay? Um, and I didn't realize this until later on, and, this, and it, that's when my life is a little more formative and understanding why this calling is happening. Okay, so that was that incident. Here we are, contact, spring 1983, okay? Saturday night, I used to work four 10 hour days. I worked up in Hillsburg at a cabinet shop, okay? 
Um, and I get Thursday, I used to get Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays off. Um, it was our, uh, it was, it was our Saturday night. I remember that very distinctly. There's a reason why. Um, and we were watching TV till midnight, and we turned in around 3:30 in the morning. I get woken to the sound of chance. I don't know how to explain it. It's like chance along with the power generator. And any of you who, per who do purchase this book, the actual sound effect is on there called the Orange Sphere sound effects. You know, I, I duplicated it in my studio. I actually got a pretty good sound of what it actually is. It was kind of like a like that, I see orange light, and it looked like waves of orange light, ripples of bright orange light flashing across the hill. I go, Susie, get up. Get up. She doesn't wake. I go, get up. She doesn't wake. She sound out. She's got snoring. The cat's asleep. Nobody's waking up. I'm in my boxers. I go, come on. And so I'm shaking her. She doesn't get up. I get out of bed. I go walking out of the living room. I see the, the orange light flashing off the beard towels. I look in my daughter's room. And as they go on, she's just a little kid there, and she's asleep. And I, I look out, and the light's flashing off her and her wall. And I go to look out the um, window on the hill, and of course, those pine trees are there, okay? All those pine trees you saw in that picture, they block the view. And there's also a video of that, too, the view from the window of what I actually see in that, in that book, too, wherever it is. Um, but the, the, all I see is this bright orange light coming through. It almost looks like a Caltrans work crew, except a really bright road, road crew orange light. That's make no sense. Why would that be on the hill? So I walk out the living room with my boxers. I go to the front door, slide two slide bolts off the door, unlock the door, and as I, I walk onto the porch, this is an actual view from the porch. The field is glowing orange like a fire, like you know what a forest, what it looks like when there's a wildfire and it glow. It's like that, and I'm, oh my god, there's a fire in the hill. And so I step out of the gate, walk out, as I walk out here, here's 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 the house. I step out of the gate here, and I turn to my left. My brother's house is here. I'm standing here and I look. And this is a huge walnut tree, just so you know. And that's about the size of that orange sphere. It's covering about three feet off the ground. It looks like a ball of fire. It's towering over that, that walnut tree. I'm in my underwear. Oh my God. I go, my, my brother, I said, oh my God, Ron, oh my God. I said, the thing from the mountain is here on our property. Ron, come out here. And what, as, right as I say that, I turn around and I see this, this I'm looking at the sphere. And immediately, I said, these appear before the sphere, okay? You have two grays, typical grays, okay? They're dressed all in black, like a, like a spandex black. They've got something covering their feet. They have four digits, both hands. Then the one in the middle is about seven to eight feet tall. He's got, he's got, he, he, he's got uh, like a, a humanoid looking skin, like a hard color, mixed with a gray almost. They're standing there, and all I was was I, I, all I remember being is just petrified, terrified. And, and people say they, you know, I was talking to you earlier about wanting to meet. I, I was terrified. I made a big mistake going out there, okay. And what, what I, I wanted to investigate, I was concerned why my wife wasn't waking up, my kids, uh, fire on the hill possibly. When I went out there, I made a mistake. I see my front door. I couldn't even move my head. I was stuck in one position. All I could see is my peripheral vision. I was standing right there where that where that where that gate was. I look back and I can see my front door open, still open, and the light going inside of my house. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. I look at these things, I just, I pass out. Okay, the first thing I do is I faint. And right as I go down, I stop at my knees, and that's the last thing I remember. Next day, I was waking up at 10, at 8 o'clock in the morning. Now, there is literally from 8, from 3.30 in the a.m. to 8 o'clock, four and a half hours of missing time there, okay? I'm bewildered. I don't know what's going on. It's Sunday morning. Susie's already out of bed. She's making breakfast. She hands me a cup of coffee. My, my daughter's watching TV, and I come out in my bathroom, and I, she says, is everything okay? And I don't know. She goes, what's wrong? I said, I don't know. She says, no, she says, something's wrong. What's wrong with you? I said, what do you think of aliens? And she goes, what do you mean? I said, what do you think of aliens? And she goes, they aren't real. They don't exist. I said, how do you know they don't exist? She did, wasn't very receptive about it at the time, okay? I said, what about, I said, what are, I said, you're Catholic, I'm Catholic, we're both raised Catholic. 
I said, what about angels? What do you think of them? She says, what do you mean? Why are you asking? I said, what do you think angels are? I said, what do you, come on, seriously, what do you think angels are? And she says, I don't know what the Bible depicts them as, little cherubs or babies. I said, oh, they're different. She says, I don't want to discuss this. She's just, she's just getting weird. So she lets me go, I eat breakfast. I go down to, uh, after breakfast, I walk down the hill to my mom's house and visit my mom. As I get down to the parking lot, my dad is once again on top of the ladder and he's at the security light this time. And he's up there and he says, Mike, hold this ladder for me. So I go down, hold the ladder. I said, what are you doing? He goes, replacing the ball. Uh, um, he says, that's weird. He goes, that's weird too. And he goes, I go, why is that weird? He goes, it's a brand new ball. I just put it in last week. I said, how long do they usually last? He said, six months, a year. It's just strange. And he just comes down the ladder. I go, that's strange. I said, first thing I thought of, that ball burned out. Okay, the ball in my dark room was burned out. Okay, and this is this this is the second time that I'm seeing stuff burned out after when this is going on, and um, I'm thinking it's all coming together. It's like weird, what's going on? So um, he says, "Go in the house." He says, "Mom's got some coffee in there." He says, "I'm going to finish pouring mom's. I'm going to come in." So I go into the house, and my mom is sitting at the uh, kitchen table, and she, she says, "I was just talking about you." She says, "You know what? She's an article in the, in the Press Democrat this morning." She says, hey, she says, check this out. She says, I thought about you because what you told me, what you saw in the mountains and stuff before. She says, she says, it's Sonoma County Sheriff's deputy who was, who was uh, cruising uh, the 101 freeway just south of Santa Rosa at the Katati grade, and he saw a cross-shaped UFO. He said, and, and it went from the snow, from the Katati grade over to the Petal in the Valley. That's not where we live. He saw it going up and down, and then just disappeared. And that was last night. I'm thinking, oh my God. And so, oddly enough, I looked for that article, couldn't find that article, but I did find a reprint of that article out of the Press Democrat Guerneville Times, okay? And um, this is, here we are, 1983 when this happened to me, okay? Here we are, this re reprint from this article says, mid 80s, it says, uh, they're talking about different abductions, but it says this one down here. Several days later, the front page of the local newspaper, the Press Democrat told of a UFO that had been seen in the early morning hours crossing over the Highway 101 south of Santa Rosa. They described it as being an X. Now, I first time thought of X, cross. What do, they, what do people do? They go X minutes, they take the cross out of Christmas, okay? I said, oh, that's odd. I said, it's a reprint. I said, the original article was about a cross-shaped UFO, but they reprinted it with this X. I believe it was the same object that had been seen days earlier, so it's been seen more than once in that general vicinity, okay? And so it's all coming together with me. You know, it's, it, it, I got beat, I got beat and wiped out from exhausted from this experience, and this is what happens every time I have an experience, I'm exhausted and wiped out. So um, I, I go home, I told Susie, I need to lay down and take a nap. So I lay down and take a nap, um, wake up a little while later, and I, I tell her, I said, I told my kid, I said, why don't, you, why don't we uh, go down and see uh, Ron, my brother, and his, um, and he could play with their niece. So we go down and I'm talking to my brother while they're playing, my wife and I, and my brother says, little brother, what the hell is wrong with you? Why were you in the field last night saying, oh my God, Ron, oh my God, Ron, get out here quick, there's all this stuff thing from the mountain. He goes, what is this, alien crap again? I go, dude, I said, I wasn't out there. I lied. <laughs> yeah, just, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't want to admit it, I don't want to get into it. But I, said, I wasn't out there. He said, yeah, you were. And his old lady goes, you were, Mike, you were out there screaming, what the hell is wrong with you? I said, well, if I was out there and you heard me screaming, why didn't you look? He said, I'm not getting out of bed for you, you moron. Why are you out there screaming? And I said, I wasn't out there. And the first thing I, first thing I went through my mind is why didn't he see the light that I saw? Because his house back that hill too. But he worked for a movie company, and his windows were lined with movers pads. So that's why he didn't see the light. Okay. And I denied it as the day as long as I was out there. But the odd thing is they heard me out there, and that's exactly what I said when I said, I, I said, oh my God, Ron, it's the thing from the hill. And I said, turn around, and they appear. So he heard me. I'm thinking, I'm sure she would have looked out there. I really wish she would have looked out there and seen what I'd seen and what happened to me. So that night, I go to bed, really tired, um, and um, I wake to the feeling of uh, being pulled through my roof, okay? I'm just like, I'm you swaying know, up into the sky, okay? And all of a sudden, I come to, and I'm levitating in midair. I'm not laying on a table like everybody says, laying on a table. I'm levitating in midair. There's nothing under me, okay? And this is my view of my feet from, from what I saw. There's two graves at my head, that's right about here, looking down. There's a gray at my feet. There's this tall humanoid, you can see the fleshy appearance of a white room. Um, like I said, he's dressed in almost like a robe type of thing, almost like a priest would wear, okay? They're dressed in the spandex at this point. Um, I look there, there's two little blue beans. He's, I, 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 one of them is holding a little baby. 
okay? I, I, I didn't know what's going on here. And um, then there's a green one back here. And I don't know if it's synthetic or Android or what. I'm just sitting there. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I'm, I'm paralyzed. And I'm a young man, okay? I was a cabinet maker and I was in really good shape then. And I was being asked. I go to pull myself up. As I actually get myself up a little bit. And as I pull myself up, this being at my feet literally raises the hand. It's like that. And I just go down, back down. Yeah, I couldn't move. And there's a syringe in this back counter. It's about that long, okay? It's about a foot long. He takes with one thrust, with one thrust as I'm laying this beam, goes like this, takes that syringe, right in the center of my cranium, leaves that mark on my forehead, there's a hole that I put two into my, my forehead right there. And then he just goes straight into my center of my cranium, and immediately the whole floor of the ship disappears, and I'm communicating with him. I'm hovering over my brother's house and looking through the ceiling. He says, what is the hierarchy here? They're all talking, it's like they all communicate at once. You don't communicate with one, they don't talk, but they, they tell they use telepathic means, but when they do, they use like almost like a collective when they talk. So what is the meaning of the hierarchy here? Who is this? Do you have a relationship? Do you have the same DNA? What's going on? So this is my brother, this is wife, that's their kid. Then the next thing I'm over my parents' house, they said, this, who is this? I said, this is my dad, my mom, and my little brother. And the next thing my, my brother and sister house is across the street on their property. We're doing the same thing over there. Finally, I said, where's my wife? Said, where's my wife? I said, we're not interested in her. You know, well, I, I, I said, where's my daughter? I said, we're not interested in either one of them. I said, no. I, I started getting scared. I didn't. I really didn't think they were gonna return me, to be honest. I, I thought they were, this was it, and they were gonna return me. And um, all of a sudden, I started crying. I was thinking, I'm not gonna see my family again. As soon as I started crying, they sensed me crying, all of a sudden, I went <laughs> back down my bed. And I wake up, whoa, she's going, what's wrong, what's wrong? Okay, it was almost like they did a procedure here, okay, like, they're, like they did a procedure and they're testing out the communication because this gets it, 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 a little deeper, the message gets very deep. So that, that's, that's that experience. And then here we are, it's still spring of 83, a couple weeks later, after that, after that abduction. And um, I am having difficulty sleeping at night because of these, these experiences. So I started leaving the television set on, um, to fall asleep due to the needed the noise and the light from the TV because it just made me feel like there's not a silence there. And um, one night I'm laying in bed and um, I was in this one before sleep timers, the TV just went out. Oh, oh no, what's wrong with the TV? So I get up and I see the check the knob's still out, so it's still on. Um, and I go look behind the dresser and it's plugged in. Oh no, the TV's out and she goes, Oh, come on, go to bed, it's late. What's wrong with you? Just go to sleep. I said, no, I can't. I said, I, I just, the alarm clock's not working too. The power's out, look. Said, oh, so I'm gonna go to the kitchen, check the breakers. So I walk out to the, I said, she goes back to sleep. I go out there, I'm checking the breakers are all on, okay? And I look, I'm sitting at the sink, I get a drink of water, and I'm looking out the window, and I see our neighbors way across the road there. Their light's on. Well, how's that, how come our light's up? It's great. So I go back, and I try to go back to sleep, and I start dozing off, and suddenly the same feeling again. Out, out, out through the roof of my house, going up to the sky, okay? Next thing you know, I wake up in this orange room this time. It's not white, it's orange. And it's more of a comforting feeling, more relaxing feeling, but I'm still really agitated, okay? And, 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 and um, I first thing I remember saying is, I'm dreaming, this is a dream, this is another bad dream, uh, this isn't real. They said, no, you're not dreaming, this is very real, and that's the problem with all of you, you don't believe. I go, this, this, what's, what's going on? I said, why am I here? They said, we have messages that we need to give you, and we will continue to take you until we get our messages to you. And I said, you know what? You can't do this. I said, you're kidnapping me. You're holding me hostage here. I, I don't want to be here. I, I, you're dragging me out of bed. You're messing up my whole life. I, I don't want to be part of this. And they said, he's not ready. I'll sit down here. He's not ready yet. I'll sit I'm back in bed. I'm up, I'm just dripping wet with cold sweat. She wakes up, she's calm down, what's going on? What's going on? I said, I just getting too much, I can't deal with this. And um, so I go to work in the morning, and when I get to work, the first thing I do is go to the restroom, I get all, all the way up to the Mill Street where I work, go to the restroom, I look in the mirror, and that's my first notice that mark on my forehead, just so you know. I look in the mirror and say, What is that thing? I'm looking at it, it's been there since thousand years, okay? It still stays there, and I've got doctors examine it. You don't know what exactly it is. Um, so I get home from work that night, 
and that is what's on my porch. So, you know, when I get home from work that night, Susie says, you need to talk to the pastor. She says, you're going to talk to the pastor. I said, I'm not going to talk to the pastor. She says, do me a favor. She says, talk to the pastor for me. She says, for, just please. I said, fine. So we go see Pastor Grant. And I'll beat to the punch. I go right in the door. I figure you're dragging me here. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be quite blatant about what I'm here for. And um, first thing I said, Grant says, Mike, what's going on? What, what can I do for you? I said, UFOs and aliens. What do you think of them, Grant? <laughs> he goes, UFOs and aliens. He says, what do you mean? I said, you think they're real or they make believe or what? He goes, they're very real. He goes, they're real. He goes, yeah. He says, it's all over the Bible. He says, my God. He says, he starts going on. He starts talking about Elijah walking along with Esau, going up in a whirlwind with chariots of fire going asunder. He says, then he says, then he goes on about the two messengers sent to Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, these are beings. He says, these are beings coming down and, and, and telling him they're going to destroy this whole town. He says, it goes on and on. And then he starts talking about <clears throat> Moses and the burning bush. He went from one thing after the other after the other in the Bible. Um, and, then, and then he said, but usually these people have some sort of mark or whatever, something's changed in their life significantly. He said, they, they find God or something's going on in their life. And, and I, I said, he says, do you have any marks or anything? I said, yeah, this is on my forehead. He goes, he goes, he said, oh my God, he said, that's the seal, 144,000 that are sealed. And I, I wound up looking that up. The seal of God on the forehead is 144,000. And I kind of go, oh, come on, dude. I said, this is ridiculous. I said, I'm through. I don't want to hear this, right? I said, I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this. So I left, I went home, and um, that week, friends at work were uh, talking about taking a trip to Waller Bridge, going camping for the weekend, and uh, they were leaving after work on Thursday night. And um, so I said, they asked if I wanted to go, and I said, yeah, it sounds cool. Probably wasn't a good idea for me to say that, but I said, it sounded cool. So I came home, told Susie, I said, you want to go camping, and take the kid up there, and so I said, yeah, we'll go up there. So we get up to Waller Bridge, everybody's, 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 everybody's uh, sitting around a campfire, having a good time, everything's cool. And um, everybody starts turning in, you know, and we start going to sleeping bags and turning in. And I'm still up around the campfire, it's dying down. I go get in the sleeping bag, and, and we've got the baby sleeping as one, we sit two together, she's sleeping with us. And all of a sudden, I hear that TV tube sound, okay, that kind of just get up, we're leaving. She says, what's wrong? What? I said, get up, we're leaving. Get, go grab the baby and let's go. She goes, oh, come on. I said, go, move, 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 move. So yeah, I rolled the sleeping bag. All her stuff was, she thought I was nuts. I think, you know, at yeah. this point, she thought I was really. During most of this, yeah. I mean, she, it's, you know, at that point in her life, she really did. She thought I was just totally stark raving mad lunatic. Um, she grabs Angie. She starts, uh, we start running up the trail up the wall of the bridge there. As we're coming up the trail, it's, it's like probably about, I'm guessing about one. I don't know the exact time because. I didn't have a watch on that. I was camping and cars in that box. It was somewhere around 1, 2 in the morning. And it's like flashes of purple light, okay, that are going off. And as I'm looking in the bushes, I can see orange orbs all over the place. And I see, this is really not a good depiction of what I see, but it's the same orange orb with the alien face in it. As I'm, I'm, going, as I'm going up, there's two of them. As good, I go, move, move, move. Did you feel like you're being chased? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. She, she, she said the same thing. She said, she, what did you say? What did you, you gave a different description of the purple light. What did you say it reminded you of? It looked, it looked almost like, I mean, because this was like one o'clock in the morning and it almost looked like dusk, you know, and dusk doesn't happen at one o'clock in the morning. It happens, you know, obviously a lot earlier than that. So, yeah, so I, could, I couldn't figure out why it was all dusk out there. We get up to the car. I'm locked the door. She has the key shim off her side. She's got the baby. I throw the seat, sleeping bag in the back. She's putting the baby in the car seat. I get in the car. I start the engine, and, and I, I go to back out. I put my seat, and as I'm backing out, the car seat's empty. And I go, where's Angie? And she goes, in the car seat. I turn around, where's Angie? She says, in the car seat. That's no she's not. And she's back in the car seat. I go, oh, shit. I said, move, move. We boogie. I get out of there. I go down that little road there, out of Waller Bridge there. I hit the river road, and I'm doing about 80 miles an hour, deadly, doing about 80 miles an hour down the road trying to get out of there. And I look behind me, and all I see is this white light in the sky that's following our car. It follows us all the way down through Fulton, follows us all the way to the 101 South, and just disappears after we go 101 South, okay? So these beings have been showing a very visible presence in my life for quite a while. They've shown interest in my daughter. When I talk to my daughter about that, she doesn't want to hear about this. She says, don't tell me how I've been by this in here. She says, I don't want to hear this. I said, and, and, and these beings have shown a very visible presence. Then what happens here, the chapter 13, the triangle shift. Now, once again, here's the property again that we lived on. My car used to park right here. 
I used to have to be to work by 6 o'clock in the morning, which meant leaving my house by 5, 40 minute drive to Hillsburg Main Street from Adam uh, Eagle this afternoon, gave me 20 minutes of coffee and cigarettes when I got to work. Okay? Um, so I walked down the, I walked out of the house, 5 o'clock in the morning, I always checked my watch when I went to work with the microwave watch. Same thing, okay? I want to make sure everything's right. I come down here, I'm walking down this, this thing, and I get to my car here, I got my cup of coffee in my hand, I put the cup of coffee in the roof of the car, pull the key to the pocket, I lock it, put the key in the ignition, go grab a cup of coffee from the top of the car, and I look up and I say, See this? It's a huge black triangle trip ship. I don't know if anybody can see that. It's kind of a hard thing to see. But it's, a, it's, it's gigantic. This is the property of seven acres. This is how big it was. It, it stretched the entire width of the property. It's translucent black. You can almost see through it. And in the center, there's one orange light. As I'm looking up at this thing with my coffee, I'm going, and it's just silent, moving very slowly. It comes right above me, and it stops. And it hovers completely still without making a sound. There's no turbulence. It's not anything we have. No helicopter we have or anything can hover. Silent and perfectly still without making a single sound. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I see the flash of purple light again. The same flash that I saw at work, Wall of Bridge. Okay? And all of a sudden I just see the flash of purple light which starts moving again. Heads west, direction of travel, over the mountains, and disappears. It takes all of about uh, probably 10 seconds to approach me, 15 seconds of a hover, in probably 30 seconds, so we're looking at maybe a minute tops, okay, that this whole scene happens. I get in my car, what the hell is this? Drive to work, get to work. I get to work, I get out of my car, mind you, I should be 20 minutes early. I walk into work, everybody's working. I go to get coffee, I say, oh, they came in early, they're working overtime, whatever today. I go get my coffee, <laughs> I get my cup of coffee, I pull my cigarettes out of my pocket at the time, my supervisor, Alex, and says, Mike, what are you doing? I said, I don't have a smoke, dude, why? Well, Get to work, you're late. I said, I'm not late, I said, I'm 15 minutes. He says, you're late. Just look at the time clock. It's 20 after 6. So I, I, I said, oh my God, I'm sorry. I said, oh, did work. your watch register? My watch still didn't register. It didn't? It did not register. That, 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 it, it registered. What my, what my watch said was that I had 15 minutes still to still. go. I still had 15 still. minutes to go. But the time clock said 20 after. Now, the weird thing is when I got home, I checked that watch again because, and I never wore another watch again after that, just so you know, because I checked that watch and it, I, you know, I thought it lost time. I personally thought my watch lost time, but it, there's that confusion. I didn't know where it went, what happened, I, I didn't have a clue what's going on. All I know is I saw this thing. I thought it was, I seriously thought some weird project the government was working on, but I know now that it couldn't have been because we still don't have that. We have the blimp. But the blimp isn't capable of that. It's not translucent. You can't see through this thing. It doesn't just sit there perfectly still. It, it, it just, it, it's, not, it's not capable of doing that. This is not our technology. Not yet. We don't have this technology, not even to this day. My dad was Air Force. I know this is not our technology. We do. It's not back then. 1983, we did not. 1983, we did not. This, this is when we're speaking of. So, but anyway, there's, there's literally, like, like we're talking about 40 minutes of missing time here, okay? And it's just, the whole incident, I'm not sure what happened there, okay? Um, so now here comes the, really one of the key factors that happens in this whole thing. Chapter 14, Terror Drive, probably the most frightening experience I've ever had in my entire life. Once again, I told you I work in Hillsburg, I'm now leaving <laughs> 40 minutes early because I don't want to be late for work, okay? So I should have 40 minutes getting to work. I, I'm cruising up here, I get past Santa Rosa, up at where Winds was. Now these wineries weren't here back then. I, this is a new, newer picture, and I had to put the wineries in it because that's what's there now, okay? They weren't there, it was just fields, no lights, and desolation once you get past Santa Rosa that time, back in that day. Um, as I get past Santa Rosa, I'm about three and a half to four miles south of Mill Street exit. All of a sudden I look in my passenger window and I see this out in the field, it's a bright light, so, and it's just, sailing straight from it. What the hell is that? It was like four wheelers, something four wheeling at that time in the morning. It's just odd. So the thing comes comes out comes out from um comes out from, from from the field, gets in behind me, and that's what I see in my rear view mirror. It just comes right on top of me. Get like, off my butt. Like what is going on? And as I get a little further, all of a sudden my car just goes just like it doesn't just kill it, it just dies. I lose everything. I lose all of my lights. I lose my tape deck's not playing anymore. I go to steer to the left because it starts going to the right and it's not steering. And, and, and all of a sudden my car just kind of lifts. 
went, oh my God, I crash. And it lifts and, I, and, and it moves over into the field, okay? And as it's in the field, all I hear behind me, I, I, and I still get flashbacks of this to this day, is the sound of a, a diesel pickup truck. That's what it sounds like, just like a diesel pickup truck behind here. And I hear, <laughs> and I go, hey, hey, what are you doing? My car's jerking all over the place. It just goes, boom, down on the ground. I'm like, what the hell? Well, I'm getting pissed at this point, okay? I think they just destroyed my car. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the driver's seat, and I look up my side rear view mirror there on the driver's side, <laughs> and that's what I see approaching my vehicle. Okay? I know the hat looks ridiculous, but there's there's a significance to that hat, believe it or not. Okay? Um, this is what I see approaching my car, and I go, what the hell? I roll my windows, lock the door, and I jump in the back seat, and I'm trying to hide on the floor. How ridiculous. They knew I'm in this car, and I'm trying to hide <laughs> Okay? Um, they, they come up to the side of the car, and this, this, is what I, this is what I see as I'm lying on the floor. These beings, three grays, and the one humanoid again, he's got a black hat. I later find out, after, after research about hats, it comes from the Roman Catholic Church, the clergy. They wear black hats with a beret, okay? This is not a beret, but a significant hierarchy, okay? And I'll get into, because this is, a, this is when they start telling you what they really are, okay? Um, I, I'm, I'm laying on the floor, I'm getting really tired, like I'm ready to pass out, and all of a sudden this being right here raises his hand, he's got four digits on his finger, he raises his hand and, this, and goes like this, all of a sudden this finger turns white, and the rest of the hand turns white, and the whole car fills with white light, okay? The next thing I remember is coming to in an extremely white room, no doors, no windows, I'm completely naked, there's one bench running the length of it, there's bright white light but no fixtures. No, no visible sign of where this light is coming from. Well, what the hell? This time, I'm extremely relaxed. And I'm, I really, it's like this has gone on so much in my life. I'm at the point, I want to know what's going on. I really want to get to the bottom of what's up. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get to the bottom right now. So I go over to that bench, I get up, I'm looking around, I go to that bench, and I sit there, and it's just really, just pure silence. No sounds of those hummings, and just silence, okay? And I, and I close my eyes, and I'm sitting there. All of a sudden, I feel a presence, like, some, like a being's there or somebody's there. These three beings are there. They're completely stark naked. Okay, the two rays of humanoid, they're stark naked. I'm naked. I know how to communicate with them already. And the first thing I said to them, I said, "Where are my clothes and where are yours?" <laughs> they said to me, "Well, in your world, we wear clothing because it's your custom." Where we are, it's not our custom to wear clothing. And you don't wear clothing when you're with us. So, oh, I said, why am I here? I said, let's get to the bottom. I said, so you've, you've been doing this repeatedly to me. I said, I want to know what's going on. I said, they said, well, first of all, you're going to remember every bit of this visit. It's not going to be cloudy or foggy. You'll remember this visit because this is an important visit. And um, they go on and they uh, said, first thing I want to discuss is your lineage. They say, You've been selected because of where you come from. I said, where is it that I come from? They said, you come from kings and queens. And I go, okay. I said, I do remember my grandmother saying something about that. And I said, what's this got to do with anything? And they said, well, your great-great-grandfather uh, got your great-great-grandmother pregnant, and he loved her. But he wasn't allowed to marry her for love. He had to marry somebody else because he had to keep the line pure and royal. So he married somebody for not love, and um, later he had another affair where he got somebody else pregnant, and he went and he shot the mother and the unborn child, which was a boy, then turned the gun on himself and killed himself. And for this, his parents have a very, very strong remorse over this stuff. They said, do you remember seeing a baby in one of your visits? I said, yeah, I do. They said, that is your great-great-uncle that was the baby that was extinguished. Do you remember when you were in that bar and your dad was trying to take your life? I said, yeah. And they said, that was us. That was protecting you. Because we didn't want history to repeat itself. Okay? We want you to carry this message, and that's why we've chosen you, not just you, but others like you. We've been hand-selected for this message. I go, what is the message that you want to tell me? And they said, well, first thing it does is the walls start turning and I'm still, the floor turns into, well, I'm looking at rainforest and our planet being destroyed and, and all the garbage and pollution and all this stuff. They said, very bad stewards of this world. 
and, and this, this world's being destroyed by your people. Um, the, the other thing that's happening here is, um, I'm going to go further. The floor changes like that. There's, this is over Petaluma, and there's just this huge battle with all these spheres, and there's, there's, there's you can't get flying saucers, and you're just blowing the hell out of, uh, out of my town. It's what's going on here. This is a battle that's going to happen. This is a stage of a battle, and you need to know that you're going to be invaded. They're already here, and they're already working with your government. They're helping your government build weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and weapons that will annihilate people, and weapons that they're going to try to use against us. So I said, who are you? They said, we are the angels that your Bible speaks of. We are the guardians of our planet. That is not your planet. You are just living on our planet. You're a host there. And you're not doing a good job there. You need to warn people about this battle because a lot of people are going to be extinct, extinguished and annihilated over this battle. I said, oh, come on. I said, I'm warn, how can I warn somebody about something like this? I said, you'll figure out a way. You have a mark on your forehead that we put on there. That's our seal. That's a mark. And we put it on your forehead. You're going to think of a way to incorporate that into when you tell people about this. I said, this is ridiculous. I said, why don't you just fly in and, and tell people? They said, this will start the battle premature because as soon as we fly in and actually do this, your, your, your government, along with the forces, other alien forces, he, they said, understand that there is good and bad in everything. Like I was explaining earlier, there's good and bad in everything. And, and the, uh, basically, the way you're going to judge them is by their deeds. Are they producing good deeds or bad deeds? Are they, are they positive or negative? Um, you need to teach people how to, uh, to discern this. There's also beings, we are, we are the angels, but there's also other beings from other worlds that preach what we're preaching or teach what we're teaching, the words they were, you teach what we're teaching, um, that, that we want you to know, and I, I hate to say this to people, because and, and, right, I don't know how people feel, but they say, Jesus is our king. He still lives, he's still breathing, and he's among us. You were given an opportunity, he came here to teach you the right way to be, and you murdered him. Your people murdered him and annihilated him, and he's, he's risen and he lives with us. We will come back, and we will rehabilitate our planet at some point. And the ones that don't belong won't be there. And um, then they go on. Next scene appears, and I'm just at the bus stop, okay, and it's the orbs of the bus stop. Okay, I, I, I said, I remember that, that's me and my brother at the bus stop. <clears throat> that was us. We've been with you since you've been a child. We've been working with you, and we're finally ready to hear this message. I said, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel as though I, I'm the right person for this to be doing this. And he said, you absolutely are a great person, and you are going to spread this message. And all of a sudden, my body just turned really hot, white, back in my car, fully clothed. I'm sitting there, the lights behind me still. I hear that that diesel truck engine behind me. That my car lifts up. I, the car lifts up, goes over to the side of the road. The key turns off. Shift motor goes up to park from 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 drive. Car starts up. Lights go on. Tape deck starts playing. With that, to my driver's side, this passes me on the freeway. And it's a hovercraft. It's got no wheels. It's uh, white. It has running lights. It looks like a light on the front of it. Uh, I, I put, it, put the car in drive. And I start chasing this thing up the freeway as it's going out toward right one work. We've got my buddy Alex from work, one of my supervisors, comes up next to me. And he's next to me on the freeway. And we're chasing this darn thing up the freeway. And Alex goes like this. What is this? Like? I don't know. I don't see what I see. And so we get up to Bill Street, right where our exit is, and this thing's just toying with us. And literally, it goes straight up in the sky and disappears. We exit, and our exit our work was right there at our at our exit. And we get out of the car. And now, mind you, I should be 40 minutes to work. As I'm getting out of the car, the buzzer's going off for work to go to work. Okay, so I get 40 minutes of time missing here. Okay, oh my God. Okay. And the first, and the first thing Alex said to me is, "Mike, what, what the hell was it?" I said, "I don't know. You saw what I saw, you." And as I figured, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling anybody about this. As I get in, as I get in, as I'm heading in the door there, Rick, another supervisor, says to me, he says, "Mike, hey, uh, what was your car doing in the field out there?" <laughs> and I go, "My car wasn't in the field." He says, "Don't tell me what your car was." And he says, "I," he says, "I stopped to ask if he needed help." He says, "I walk up in the field. He says, you don't know where there. Your keys are ignition. Your car's all locked up tighter than drum." I said, oh, I walked to get help. He goes, no, you didn't. He says, I'm heading up south on the freeway. He says, you weren't heading south. He says, you weren't north. There's nowhere, nowhere to go. Where the hell were you? <laughs> and with that, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't going to tell. I was abducted by aliens, and I'm in this ship, and they're telling me all this stuff. <laughs> and I'm not doing this, right? This isn't happening, right? 
And so, I go, I, you know, a tow truck, I found a tow truck and he helped me out of the field. He goes, oh, come on, you really will expect me to believe this? And he says, you know, and I want to hear the truth on this. I said, we've got to go to work. I said, so punch time for I go to work. Everybody's coming up to me all day long asking, what, what happened to you? Why don't you cry? I, I didn't know what to say, okay? Mm -hmm. I made a big whopper. I wasn't going to tell people the truth. I, I just wasn't ready to come out like I am right now and discuss what's going on, okay? Um, I, I kept it to myself. I didn't even share it with Susie, okay? I, I went home that night. That whole day was so weird. I never shared it with Susie. I kept it myself. And you know, I thought I got away with it. Literally, it went on back. Here we are back, 83, okay? And I never saw them again until 2000. That's a long time, and it's a lot of years without having any contact with any beings. And I figured I got to leave it. I don't have to do anything. Well, as I was telling, we're in Garden Grove. I moved. I got tired of Sonoma County, okay? So we moved to Southern California, and we were living in a trailer park, literally two miles of Disneyland. And um, by nine o'clock at night, and the fact that I spoke like a chimney, I don't know. That. Right. I'm sitting on the yard and I'm having my cigarette for the evening. And as I'm um, sitting in the yard, I look up in the sky and I see this. Mm -hmm. Seven white, they aren't orange, just kind of white. White orbs, okay? And they're just glowing bright white. And they're probably, like, like I was saying, probably about 10 to 15 feet in diameter. And they're in a perfect uniform, just following one another. And they just go silently like that. And if Susie, get out of here. The door's open. Come out of here. She's I'm busy. I said, Come here now. So she comes flying out the door, and um, here, you explain, come out of here, and you, you, you tell, which I, I'll, I'll tell it, but I want you to share it from another perspective. As these things float by, what do they do? I mean... They were, they were, they were going around, and they, uh, they got like, really big, then all of a sudden it just, they just went just straight up, just One turned into the stars, you know, like bink, 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 you stars. know, and they did. They turned into stars right before, right before our eyes. These things turned to stars. Okay, and we're going, oh my god. And I, and I go, I said to her, I said, I'm not a shit. I'm a shit. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, I'm. In. I said, they're here. I said, they're back. And she goes, what's going on? And that's when I fessed up. I told her everything. Okay, I told her everything that happened. And she said, oh, she says you're gonna have to do something. She says you're gonna. She says I don't know. She says you got to do something to get rid of them. I just. She says, you told me, you say, one, they expect you to do something, then you're going to have to do it. So I, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And that's, that's what she said. She says, you need to do it. Get them off your back. Do it. Take care of it. You Take know? care of it. That's pretty good. So I, I thought, I said, well, I guess I, she had a, she used to sell tie-dye t-shirts on the Huntington Beach Pier. She had a trailer down there for, for seven years that she'd go down there on the weekends and sell t-shirts to crowds of people. I said, you know what? How about I write a little, a little book, a little flyer book that'd be real cheap at a coffee shop and um, hand it out with your t-shirts, put them in bags. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, I, I, whatever works. She says, whatever works. Okay. We did. So literally, that, that's what we did. This is the book I wrote. This is the book I wrote back in 2000. It's copywritten 2000. Okay, it's some 64 pages long. 64 pages long. It was called Explanations. Okay, it was over the top religion. I mean, really over the top religion uh, because that's what I use for inferences and references to because there's so much I, I just so you know I have read every version of the Bible census because I, I was looking for answers lots of answers and I found them in there just so you know they're, they're all in there okay right down to Peter's vision the vessel coming down letting letting beasts off or the just one thing after the other I, I this book was 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 so small I, I did it so cheaply it was just that big People, people needed it. You know, they came back. I went down there with on Fridays, and I, I, was, I was passing them out. With it. I actually had... I, I, think was one, I don't know if anybody knows who he was at the time, okay? I put one in his bag, okay, just so you know. And, and, he, and he writes a check for it. It's a long story, actually. He writes, he writes a check for it, writes a check for it, and he goes, he goes, you know who I am? And I, and, and I go, no, he goes, I'm an author. And he says, that little book, he says, I did it, every, every bit of it. He says, you, he says, you know what, I'm, I'm, we're, we're putting together a show right now. He says, um, and we're working on the preliminary, preliminaries. He said, would you mind if I use some of this in the show? I said, be my guest. I said, yeah. I said, I don't care what you do. People come back and say, you need to write another book, dude. You need, this is a good book. I actually read the whole thing. This is good. You need to get more, do more. I said, oh, no, I'm done writing books, okay? I, I was through with that. That point, I figured I fulfilled my request. And, uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to go any more into this. I want to be over with it. Uh, here I am again. Yeah, so, so it actually, it actually worked. And, um, so anyway, 
Here we are in 2007. I am, I am still in, we're now in Newport Beach. Um, and this, I, I was curious about the whole royalty thing, okay? I started really bothering me hearing the royalty for, coming from kings and queens. I want to know a little more about it. And I remember my grandma saying that her sister knew something about it. And <clears throat> my mom's cousin, Noel, was her son who lived in San Francisco, okay? So I contacted Noel and asked him if he had anything on the family tree. He said, yeah, he sent me up. Stuff on the family tree. And um, here's, this is page five of the family tree. And this is the one that most, this is the most significant page of it. And I want, I'm going to read this to you because it's very significant. It says, the Gausses, Anna of Austria, your great-great-grandmother, maiden name, place, and date of birth unknown. Anna was employed by a family in Austria, Austria reputed to have been titled the story goes that when it was discovered that she was incentiated by courtesy of the family scion, arrangements were made to send her to America to marry Michael Gauss, apparently a family friend and covert of the, of the family philanderer, and give him a stipend for his accommodation. He was a well-bred and well-heeled gentleman, from what Jean used to say, remembering from his a childhood, a classic old guy with a cane always dressed up and never worked, okay? Um, then down here, I see this. Sorry, I have so little on these people, but I'm sure she really can fill you in. That was my grandma's sister, but she told me about it. So she knew more about it than I, than I did, and than she did. And she was already dead, okay? So I went, oh, I want to find out who this is. So I, we did research. Susie was, Susie was huge on this, okay? She did. Yeah, the research, the research, on, she, the research she was on this was, the research on this was incredible when I looked up in, in that time frame. What did you, yeah, I, I, I just Googled 18, 80s uh, Austria, okay. in the country of Austria, and it came up uh, Franz Joseph, here. who was here. Here we go. Fra yeah, Franz it's conference Joseph, Rudolph, that's conference Rudolph 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 Rudolph. 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 of the Holy Roman Empire. That's me on the right. Yeah, check right down the bowl there. I got the bowl there. He's got the bowl. We look so much like even the hairline and everything. Okay. Now, that's my mom on the right. That's his dad, Emperor Franz Joseph. That's his great great granddaughter. That's my mom at 70 years old. And that's him. That's my mom shaved her head. She looks so much like him. It's uncanny and it's just mm -hmm. creepy. Okay? She looks just like, like Franz Joseph. He's the only king to ever hold Dumar. Dumar. He, he was uh, in, in charge for 70 years. Um, at one point, the Holy Roman Empire was poised to take over the Catholic faith. So this is very significant. Okay. Now, a lot of bloodshed too, a lot of wars in that time. A lot of bloodshed. Okay. Um, and we find out that this guy, this guy, first of all, Rudolph, now they told me that the baby was, was killed, okay? We find out that Rudolph, okay, he got my great-great-grandmother pregnant, okay? Sent her to Kansas to marry Michael Gauss, okay? Paid for him to marry this, this guy. Then he marries Stephanie in Belgium, okay? Hated her. If you read everything in Bella history about it, that she was, uh, they called her a wench and everything else. She just oh, didn't get along. Definitely Google it. Uh, Google it's it. It's very intriguing. Um, anyway, all he did was cheat on her, too, okay? And then I guess he had one other affair with a gal named Mary Vestra, in which she, he, she got pregnant, okay? Just like my great great grandmother did. And instead of sending her away, he took her and the unborn baby to the hunting lodge. Shot and killed them both, then turned the gun on himself and committing suicide. So, oh my God, this is, this is right in line with, every, with everything I'm being told, right? So, now we go down further. That's me in the center, that's Rudolph, and that's Franz Joseph. You see the similarities, okay? There's, there's just great, great similarities. This is my Uncle John, that is Maximilian, who is Franz Joseph's brother, Maximilian in Mexico. They, they, they just look incredibly so, so much alike. They just. They, 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 they're just incredibly alike. Um, now we get on further. That's my brother Rich, who's dead now, but he's the one that was with the uh, with me at the uh, bus stop with the, the little spheres. That is Archduke Franz Ferdinand, uh, Habsburg Crown Prince Rudolph's cousin. He is the one. I don't, I'm sure everybody knows. He's the one that led the United States into World War One with his assassination. You talk about bloodshed and a lot of death and a lot of bad things. Okay, so this. This family had the Holy Roman Empire behind them, but then they had that, a lot of killing leading this. So there's a lot of bad things going on there, and they have a lot of remorse about it. Um, goes even further back to Julius Caesar, the Holy Roman Empire. That's Julius Caesar on the left, and that is me on the right. And you see the family moves upwards. That's me up here. That's Julius Caesar. The hair, line, the hair is almost identical. It might have the curly hair. It's identical. Yeah, it goes back to easy. That's how far back it goes. It's just ridiculous. 
Now, on August of last year, my niece was getting married, and um, we we're heading out to the wedding. And I, I told Susie the day that, that my daughter came up for she was in Southern California, and she came up. And I said, hey, we, I want to stop by the barn on the way out there. And she was lying. I said, I just feel like I have to be there at that barn that day, right? She goes, that's odd. I said, the barn where my old dark was. This, that's where those pictures were actually taken, just so you know. And this wheelbarrow, just so you know, this is the stall that my dad almost killed me in, okay? And this wheelbarrow is the same wheelbarrow. It's still there, literally, on August 2013. That wheelbarrow is still there, his same old wheelbarrow left in that barn there, okay? Um, and that's where that happened. All those, I see all these orbs in this barn. So I take eight, okay, I, go, I get out of the car. I take 15 seconds in the barn because they're waiting for me. I had my daughter waiting. Mm -hmm. I had my step-granddaughter waiting, my grandson and my wife. I take eight shots on the properties of the camera. It shows there's one minute between all eight shots, okay? So this, that's one minute worth of pictures in 30 seconds in and out, a minute and a half. I come out, to, I come out, as I leave the barn, I come back out to the barn, uh, out to the car where it's been moved, the car. They're no longer parked in the same spot. They're parked all the way back in. What the hell? I go, I, and, and I get in the car, and what did you yeah, say? Yeah, boy, I told, I, I told, I, I told you to You asked, how, what was I doing? You know, he, he was in there for five minutes because we were watch we were watching the clock we were running late for my niece's wedding and you know and it was uh between 146 and 151 that he was in there and we're all panicking in the car because the wedding starts at two o'clock so there's so five, we, five minutes so we're rushing around you know but only accounted yeah. for a minute and a half when, the, when we down on these pictures we find more even more that you can see here we find we find that there's literally uh, like three minutes, I mean, at least three minutes of unaccounted time there, okay? Um, so I go through the other pictures, and here, oddly enough, on this particular picture, you see the orb there and everything else, but what's really odd about this particular picture is this is, I told you, remember the, bar, the dark room in that barn? This is the back side of the dark room. Remember I told you I found my, 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 my school project, and I used the tag board of it to, to cover the light leaks in the back of the wall. Well, that's still there. This is, this is my science project, and this is what it was. It was of uh, the solar system. This is my solar system poster. This is, uh, this says photos there. This is where all, I had the astronauts from the NASA mission there, and it was all about space. It was my sixth grade, sixth grade science project. And it's still on that darn wall. This is all of my stuff. It's like it's untouched in there, in the barn. And, and I'm looking there, and I said, where's this orb up there? And this is actually, this is, I still have this SD card. I saved it because I'm not going to be erasing actual images from that SD card to prove that this orb is as it is. I see that orb there. So I decided to do an enlargement of that particular orb there. And I look at it. There's an alien faces out of that orb. Now I can see the orb. You take a look at that orb. There's an alien face inside of it. And it's sitting right above my solar system mm -hmm. port. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now that, that I that I found just really odd. And now here's the here's the thing, here's the solar system pro solar system, this is the the project, the orbs up above, right where my my project of the solar system is, right? And then I go any further, I go further here, and I do some research, and this was easier to find because it was a picture. I remember they took a picture of me in the newspaper for my science project, okay? I was at McDowell School, I was just a kid. And they actually took a picture of my science project, and there's my science project. There it is. There's the pictures. My solar system poster there. There's me wearing the Coca-Cola t-shirt, that Coca-Cola shirt that my dad gave me. Um, and that's me. And the other kids for the science fair. And they even misspelled my name. They called me Michael Davies instead of Michael Davis. D-A-V-I-E-S. But they misspelled my name. And I thought, that odd. And then I started looking at those orbs in that barn. Okay? The first thing I noticed is that they were all in belts. Okay? If you look at them very closely, there's a sun in the center, there's an orange orb in the center, and these are like planets, and right? there's Mercury, Earth, Saturn, Uranus, Pluto, UB2, UB2, 2003, UB2, 313, Neptune, Chiron, Mars, Venus, Cyrus, Jupiter, and there's a sun there. Well, oh my God, this, there's a solar system there, okay? It's like right across from my science project with the solar system. It's like they're communicating with me in this freaking arm. I told her, this is weird, they're communicating with me. This is just bizarre. And so I said, what are these? I told her, I said, what are these other speakers? And I said, oh my God, I know what it is. They are parallel dimensional universes within our solar system. They are dimensional beings. They cross over dimension. They're here now, okay? They're where we are now. They're everywhere, okay? And all they have to do is cross the dimension to get there. We aren't capable of crossing that dimension. 
information, not in this level, but when we pass on to another level, we will be capable, like they are, to cross the dimensions. And this is what they're showing me, is that we aren't seeing them because we can't see that dimension. They're right. These are other planets and other, right within our solar system that we can't see. And I realize it's literally right across. That stall is right there. And that's where that orb is. There's my solar system. They're showing me their system right across from me. Yeah. Oh my God, they're communicating. They're showing me where, where it is they're coming from, right there in this picture. I'm just, I'm totally blown away by it. We're both blown away by it. We just thought it was so bizarre and interesting. Then it gets even stranger. <laughs> this this year in February, I'm not proud of it, but we live in a, a trailer park again. But we had we had we had people in our park who got in a fight over uh, a parking place. Okay, and. Um, the one man wanted pulling a gun on the other, the other guy over, over this fight. And then the guy was trying to get on the floor or whatever, right? And I have security cameras. I, 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 the reason I, one of the primary reasons I actually have security cameras isn't for crime. It's because I want to start seeing what's going on around with me. Now we have technology. We can put cameras up around us. And we can start seeing what's actually happening. I wish I would have had some cameras out at that ranch when I was living out there when I was taken. I wish I had them back then, OK? It just would have been an astronomical to have this. But anyway, the, the cops are there. And they come knocking on my door. And they ask if I have any footage on I said, I don't know. Let me check. I said, so it's going to be a couple of days. So I check, I check the footage. And I'm examining and examining and watching over and over and over. And finally, Susie says, Susie, we're watching this. This is just a JPEG from it, from the actual security camera. That's a, that, by the way, that security footage is also on that disc, that, that, that book that I, that I have there. That, that actual security footage is on the actual camera, and you can see this on it. We're looking at it very closely, and as we're looking at this very closely, Susie says, what is that in that corner there? I don't know where. And she's up there in that corner. I don't know. It's in the face, doesn't it? Yes. She says, yeah, it sure does. So I took, that, I took the footage out, put it in the computer, and I decided to enlarge it. And as I enlarge the face, this is what I see, this, this, this. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is this. what you're seeing here is a light pole going up in the front of the face. That's where the light is. The face is behind the light, and the tree is behind the face. And you can see eye, eye, the mouth, the ears, the shape of the head comes all the way down like that. It's an actual face there inside of, inside of that. And, so, and that frame there, and it's on every frame of video footage, you know, that security footage. And we're just, but when I'm looking at this, oh my God, this is so weird. But I actually have a photo of this. And I said, what does it look like? I said, why does it look so familiar to me? I said, I can't, I can't place where I've actually seen this face before. I know this face. And then I realized, when I was four and a half years old, this is my original book cover for, that, for Falling Sky that I made in 2011, okay? These are the beings that I saw in the atrium when I was a kid at four and a half years old. Now you look at that, face, those beings there, it's so similar. It's like, oh my God, it's, it's the same thing. They're showing me that was then and this is now. I'm looking at that face and I said, it, it looks so familiar from somewhere else too. I just can't quite place where else. And I said, wait, the internet. So I started looking at the internet and I dug up the face on Mars. <laughs> it looks so similar to that face on Mars. So this this is this is back in February this this year that this, this happened, and it's just it, it it's all it all just ties it all together. It really does. It like cinches it up. So what I did is from my old book cover to my new book cover, I decided to use them both. This is from 2011. This is from now. This is the new book cover, and I put them together in the beginning of a four and a half picture. Okay, basically, it's the way I look at it.